Hello, listeners. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Joe Sanook, who is the author of Thursday is a New Friday, How to Work Fewer Hours, Make More Money, and Spend Time Doing What You Want. He's also the host of the popular Practice of the Practice podcast and has been featured in Inc., Harvard Business Review, and the New York Stock Exchange. You can also see some more of his work in the new Harvard Business Review book, Boundaries, Priorities, and Finding Work-Life Balance. In this episode, we dive into your work week and how Thursday could be the new Friday and how he's done that for himself and how he even came to that idea. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Welcome to the Live For Yourself Revolution, where our mission is to highlight stories of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are truly living for themselves. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Ritter leadership and career coach focused on guiding you toward a career and life you can love. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Three internal inclinations that the research shows um, really help people be successful in business. And the assessment goes through that research and basically says, like, what's natural for you and what's unnatural for you? And so what needs some work and what doesn't? It's not like pass fail, like you're going to suck at business. But, you know, does curiosity come naturally to you or are you really kind of paralyzed by perfection and got to do it right? And Joe, where did all these inclinations, these labels, I guess, come from from yourself? You kind of start doing things oftentimes. And then you try to reverse engineer, like what just happened? You know, why, why did that work? I want to replicate what worked. And um, for me, it was noticing what was working and what wasn't working. And then, and then giving a framework to it rather than starting with, here's the framework. And I got to try to force everything into that framework. And what did work for you or what wasn't working? I guess like, what was the the analysis or the summary of that for yourself? Yeah. I think that when I first started practice of the practice, it was, um, it felt like I was trying so hard to build an audience, to sell products. You know, I had all these cheesy pop-ups on the website and just, you know, I knew nothing about business when I first started, you know, all of this. And, um, you know, I listened to a podcast and someone says, oh, the, the best way to be successful is to do Google advertising on your website and make money that way or to do a membership or, and I just kind of threw spaghetti at the wall. So I think that uh, with the the online side of things, I just didn't really stop to say like, what do I actually want? And, and you know, that's going to attract the people that want that. Uh, in the counseling world, for me, it was it was figuring out how do I just break that narrative that I was taught where, you know, you work for somebody else and you just keep, keep working for someone else and become a supervisor someday. And everything that I had been taught by my parents and school system was get good grades, get hired by someone retire happy. Uh, and, and so that to me, the idea of doing anything business-wise, like there's a lot of undoing that had to happen there. Oh, okay. You just hit on one of my most interested, like curious little topics of them all. Uh, can you tell me more about how you learned about work, like where that all came from, what your influences were, what your experiences were? And when did you yeah. realize that was something that maybe you didn't want to keep doing? Yeah, I would say, so my parents are they, they have a lot of strengths. They're, they're kind of classic baby boomers that, you know, my dad was a school psychologist, PhD level, um, and worked really hard in the school system. And my mom was a school nurse and, and they lived that kind of classic work for someone, have a great pension, retire well story. So I think that seeing that as a, a kid, the narrative of go to college and, you know, keep getting educated and then get hired. That was part of it. I was also in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout. So the idea of here, here's a goal, here's a merit badge, here's the 15 things you have to do under that merit badge. And then you have, you know, 30 plus merit badges you have to get to get Eagle Scout. And it was very analytical. It was here are the steps to do it right. If you do it, you get Eagle Scout. If you don't, you don't. And, and so a lot of you know, whether it's that or I went to Catholic school, uh, a lot of the structure I was raised in uh, said, here's the path. If you do it, you are almost guaranteed to be successful. And if you don't do it, you probably won't be. And I think that I had a lot of things in my life that really challenged that, whether it was meeting people that weren't raised in that same environment in college or uh finding myself in my ideal counseling job at a community college with golden handcuffs and realizing I wasn't that happy. 
um, or, or even a lot of life situations with, with my family or my kids, it started to kind of the cracks in the armor of that narrative of if you follow these exact steps, things are going to work out. Um, like that really got challenged over the years. So is that not true? There aren't, is there in a playbook to I can just follow certain steps and I can be successful and happy? And is it not is it not the work 40 hours a week and find a good company and be loyal and go to school and get an education and have loans, like buy a house? Like what it's not it's not real. <laughs> you know, I and I think that, that that mindset of like kind of and I'm not challenging your mindset, but the idea of if we follow this script, this will happen, um, is such an industrialist mindset. It, it's if we if we really look at who were the industrialists, you know Henry Ford, people that said you you plug it in and you know it automatically kicks out a Model T on the other side. That everything can be broken down into standard operating procedures. There's obviously things that we want to work flawlessly, such as ambulance services. You know we want to have a standard operating procedure for that. We want to have a playbook for that. Um, there is value to it. I think the pendulum swung or has swung so far in that direction that we think that's all there is. And, and so to say that there, there are aspects of that industrialist mindset that we've been given that were valuable for humans evolution, that were valuable for our own personal evolution. Um, and there's also parts of it that, that don't necessarily work. Um, you even think about how people were working in the 1800s uh, before the 40 hour work week. And they were working 12 to 14 hours a day, six to seven days a week. And, and so to look at that, they were living a farmer's schedule. So, you know, in 1926, when Henry Ford like gives us the 40 hour work week, it had been a movement outside of him, but he just wanted to sell more cars to his own employees. So he gave them weekends so they'd buy a car. Um, that framework's less than 100 years old. And that was a step forward that was needed for humans to work less, to be more efficient, to set up a lot of things in society. So I think that it's that both and that we can say it was valuable. It was good for either me personally to learn a lot of those frameworks. And I can also say, man, there's a lot of situations that that, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, the history of work is so interesting. I remember reading uh, that they created new labor laws like around breaks and things like that because of this like unbelievable terrible uh, event that happened. I think it was in, was it in New York? It was a factory and they locked the doors. So with, so the, the workers couldn't go outside. And then there was a massive fire and mm -hmm. a significant amount of people died. And they're like, Oh, these, these types of like this treatment of people and this mentality towards work is life threatening. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And we care about it now. Um, we probably should change it. And and I love that the conversation now is also moving towards not just like to your physical self, like, oh, this is just an unsafe working condition, which I know we still have a ways to go in that situation, but also to your mental health, to balance in your life. And it looks like you had you had some people around you that were helping you realize that there was a different way of working. Do you have do you have an example of someone or something that had kind of lit that light bulb for you? Yeah, I think uh, for me, it was starting to look at just what options were out there. Like, what's the menu? You know, so we have one menu that's you go to college, you get hired by someone, you follow that script. Um, but then to start to see other people that were really living differently. For me, early on, it was Pat Flynn with the Smart Passive Income podcast. Um, just hearing him talk about how you can do business in a very ethical way. You can you know, still be who you want to be and you can also make money off of it. Uh, I think that then sent me down such a great just rabbit hole of different teachers and online influencers to just learn, but then also to just practically get to meet friends that, that were business owners or that were kind of challenging how much they worked and, and thinking through that differently and doing experiments with their health or experiments with the way that they were operating things just made me think completely different about what did I want out of life. And, and even you know, during 2020, uh, bought an RV and went on the road and lived in national parks during the pandemic uh, with my daughters. And to find just, okay, I can do life different if I want to. Uh, that was so freeing and scary because there's not that exact playbook anymore. There's not, you just go work for somebody. Uh, it's okay. I have to kind of create this new model. 
I think it actually gets more complicated when you work for yourself. A lot of my clients are leaders. They work for corporations. They have work-life issues. And I go, great, you have standards you can work and you have a framework. You have other people that can do the work. You have goals and expectations that you have to meet. When you work for yourself, it's pretty much like, how much can you do? <laughs> it's just like, um, keep going. You don't have to stop. What do you have to stop for? You can always do better. And it, if if you get in that mode, because there are business owners that aren't in that mode. There are people that I'm just like, there is so much more you could do to become successful right now. Uh, but generally, entrepreneurship attracts someone that kind of is working on a beach, right? When they're on vacation, it's just like kind of this like vision that you have of an entrepreneur. And you started running your own practice and business pretty early on, it seems from your history. Like what, how it had, has your relationship with work changed over time? And what have you learned has been really like helpful and successful for you that maybe our listeners can take away from? Yeah. So for a long time, my private practice was this side gig counseling practice. While I had my full-time job, I hired several 1099 contractors to do therapy within that and had a group practice as a side job and realized that I was making more in this side gig than I was in the in my full-time job. And the first summer after I had left my full-time job and was just doing private practice, I decided, you know, this summer, why don't I just take Fridays off and just see? You know, at the end of the summer, I can reevaluate. I can decide to to work more if I need to. But this is my first summer. Let, let's give this a whirl. And the first month was the best financial month the practice had had. The next month was the best financial. And it just kept outdoing the month before. And so that experiment became how I, at that point, just lived my life. Uh, and, and in retrospect, that was something that was a thread that was there throughout. I remember at my freshman orientation at college, um, I was sitting there with an academic advisor and probably three or four other students that were setting up their schedules. And I said to the advisor, do I have to go to class on Fridays? And, and they laughed. They're like, no, this is college. Do whatever you want. Uh, if you don't want to have an 8 a.m. class, don't have an 8 a.m. class. You get to make your schedule. And so for all of undergrad, I worked a four-day week except for one semester when there was a mandatory Friday class. And so as I think back on it, even my my first nonprofit job where I was working for someone else, I negotiated a four-day work week and negotiated it around that they were paying me to drive an hour away. And it was just, hey, your gas is going to be cheaper if I do this four times instead of do it five times. So I think that that kind of natural bucking the system is inside of me uh, and it manifests in a lot of different ways. But you're right when you think about owning your own business because there's no clear stop. And that's where I think that business owners in particular have to say, like, what am I doing here? And what are those hard boundaries? Uh, what are those soft boundaries? What are we doing to make sure that you don't put the kids to bed and then you're up till 10 o'clock emailing people for networking things um, just because you could make a little bit more money? Like, when is the end of this? Because because no one's going to tell you that. No one's going to stop you. I'm so curious because it sounds like you liked having Fridays off. I was actually going to ask, is it Tuesdays off? Is it Thursdays off? What's <laughs> off? It sounds like when you when you were younger, you had this just desire to, to have less of your week be work and or at least to have an extra day. Uh, I was kind of curious, did this, did this thought process come from the fact that you were overworking? But it sounds like also this was just an ideology that you learned early on. And you're like, this just works better. Like, look, look at the results. I don't know why everyone's working Fridays. Fridays should not be a work day. Can you just tell me more about the system just so I can wrap my head around it? Yeah. So specifically the system of how it looks for my week or the kind of broader system of, of like the neuroscience behind it? Uh, for you personally, like, are you just, okay, eight hours a day, Monday to Thursday, and then I get to relax Friday to Sunday, no work, computer goes into the aquarium. If it works on Monday, good luck. Like, what, yeah. what, how do you then manage work? Yeah. So my current schedule, I start with, you know, what do I want out of, out of life? And so uh, I'm a single dad with, with sole physical custody of my kids, my two daughters see their mom man, once every few months, uh, she flies into town. Um, so it's mostly me. Um, I have a partner that um, she helps out a lot, but we don't live together. Um, and, and so I just start with, 
I want to be a great dad to these kids whose mom is not really in their lives much. Um, so what that means is we live two blocks from from the, the elementary student school. Every morning, as much as I can, I want to walk her to school. School starts at nine o'clock. I don't want to be running to an appointment. So my my start is at 930. And I want to pick her up from school every day. And she gets done at around four. So I want to be done at 330. So I'm not stressed out going into my parenting. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I, I work 930 to 330. On those work days, it's full tilt. It is back-to-back -back appointments. It is sometimes even eating during a consulting call. It, it is um, just really having minutes between meetings. For me, that really works. Uh, for a lot of people, they they couldn't do that. They wouldn't like that. Um, but to me, I'd much rather, if I'm going to have a break, have that be at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or on a day off and to get the most out of when I'm sprinting. So when I'm also, if I have a cancellation, so right before you, I had a cancellation and I recognize like this is an important podcast and I did things that could help me feel even stronger coming into the podcast rather than jumping into email or other things that would drain me before this podcast. So then on Fridays, uh, I rarely work at all. Um, so actually tomorrow, uh, at the time of this recording, um, tomorrow's Friday, um, I am going to do a couple calls with people. We're launching this seven figure practice club. Um, that's aimed at people that have seven figure counseling practices. And I'm going on vacation next week for eight days. And some people last minute before the cutoff had some questions. So I'm going to do, I think, two 15 minute phone calls tomorrow. I typically take Mondays off from scheduled appointments, but I may do a little bit of email on that day. I may meet with my assistant. Sometimes our team in South Africa um, has some last minute questions. So I may work 90 to 120 minutes uh, on a Monday. Uh, but what I found is when when you squeeze in, you know, I'm only going to work three full days and a little bit on a Monday. Um, say I have 20 tasks and I can only do 10 of them. I'm going to work on the 10 best tasks. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to outsource to my team the other things, cut things out and, and be as efficient as possible. So then it doesn't feel like I'm treading water or drowning. It feels like I'm genuinely working on the best things for my time and my energy. I can just imagine some executives listening to this and just freaking out. They're just like, this guy never <laughs> works. He couldn't get anything done. Do you ever have that type of response? And let's say someone someone is sitting in front of you right now and be like, Joe, why are you so lazy? Why aren't you working that much? How do you get anything done? I can never do that. No one will let me do that. Yeah. Well, I think I think I get that response all the time. So so yeah. So uh I, I think part of it is deciding what you want out of life and what you want out of your out of your career and out of your business. You know, we usually grow by you know thirty to fifty percent a year. Uh, we have sold out all of our podcast sponsorships at the highest rate that we've ever charged doing three episodes a week. Like we are doing well by what I want to do with the business. And so, if I saw that all of a sudden, say the numbers were dropping, that there was you know financial problems that me not doing this model was hurting my family in a detrimental way or hurting the you know, employees and staff that we have where we couldn't make payroll or things like that. Yeah, like, of course, I would reevaluate and shift. Um, but the thing is, is when you think about when are you most creative? So so most of my audience are, you know, they own the businesses. Um, they could be a mega practice of, you know, 50 to 100 clinicians. They could be just them. Um, but most of my audience are people that they're fully in charge of their schedule and they have only themselves to blame if they don't if they don't like it. So when do your best ideas come? You know, is it when you're stressed out? Is it when you're maxed out? Is it when you're pushed into a corner and you know you had the busiest week of your life? Or is it when you slow down a little bit? Is it you know in the shower or if you're out snowshoeing or maybe driving without any podcasts or music or anything? You just let your mind wander. Um, like I think about the first minute of meditation when I do that, it's like a flood of things just hit me. Oh, I haven't watered the plants. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, I forgot about that dental appointment. It just, the second you slow down, oftentimes all these ideas, all this stuff comes flooding into your brain because you've been living in such a state of hypervigilance when you're just going full tilt. I think also, you know, I was working with a consulting client earlier this week and we were just looking at, at how she's using her time. 
And, and I really encouraged her to pay attention to her energy levels. And she realized a really simple concept. And that was that her best energy is from 8 to 1030 in the morning. Uh, and so that meant that she needed to shift some of her responsibilities with her husband, with her kids in regards to her being able to work during that time. And she found that working from 8 to 1030, she got about a day's worth work of work done in that two and a half hours to be able to just dive in, get it done. The things that she would be scrambling or figuring out, or her mind was just in peak performance. And so a lot of executives, I think, they, they haven't really decided their own KPIs, key performance indicators for themselves or for their staff. They're looking at butts in the chair, hours worked, instead of like, what's what's the function of my role as, as an executive? What's the function of my role as a parent? What's the function of this person's role or the staff's role? What do we actually want out of that? And does that even have to be 40 hours a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very true. And uh, I have so many questions. Okay, we're going to start with question number one. But Joe, my entire day from eight to six o'clock at night is meetings. Hmm. What, how, how do I avoid that? What do I do? And then I still have to do my work. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in regards to specifically meetings, but what I think, how I would handle that is I would look at what's the function of these meetings. So I have a fully remote team. We have 20 employees or so. Um, two thirds of them are in Cape Town, South Africa. Most of them there don't ever meet in person either. To me, if I'm going to ask someone to meet with me across all these time zones that you know we're paying for this entire team to meet, I want to know what are what are we getting out of this meeting? Like that we couldn't get out of an email or someone posting in Asana or on Trello. Could a standard operating procedure or a quick you know five minute meeting with someone solve this? Most meetings, in my opinion, um, are just a complete waste of time. Um, I remember when I was in charge of the LPCs of Northern Michigan, so licensed professional counselors of Northern Michigan, and um, I was in charge of of their meetings for that year. And it was a two hour meeting uh, once a month. And I, before I was the president, I dreaded going to them because it would be all this parliamentary procedure. It would be all these things. And we just did a survey and said, you know, why do you come to this meeting uh, once a month that we get together for two hours? And education was part of it, of kind of learning best practices and connection. So we totally shifted the meeting to be half networking, doing experiential activities to help counselors meet each other, talk to each other, kind of not just sit with the same people. And then we started bringing in experts once a month to talk about, say, mental health in the school system. So I think starting with, okay, you're in meetings, you know, start to finish all day long. Is that necessary? You know, there's jobs that your job is to do that. But I would challenge that to say, are there ways that we can be more efficient with that time? And generally too, if you went to your boss and said, hey, am I being paid to be in meetings? Your boss probably would say no. <laughs> A lot of times the, the meetings that we think we have to be at need to be challenged. I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up. And I hope everyone is actually taking that to heart and going to your meetings and saying, what is the purpose of this meeting? What are people gaining from this meeting? And could that be achieved in a different way that honors people's time more? Mm -hmm. Even just sending a, an email ahead of time saying, here's the five things we're going to cover in this meeting. Please come prepared with these things. And then starting the meeting with, hey, I want to start with the email that I sent you all yesterday. And so people that aren't in the habit of reading their email and being prepped for the meeting, start getting prepped for the meeting. And then setting a time limit. You know, when meetings start late, when meetings end late, um, that's not good for anybody. And, and so to say, okay, we're going to start right on time. Please make sure you're there. Um, here's what we're going to have. We're going to have these reports. We're going to look forward. We're going to look backward. We're going to make these decisions. Um, we all got the updates. Please read through them you know, quickly beforehand so that we can actually get to work. Uh, to, to me, what are we achieving that we need to be together for that streamlines things that we couldn't do uh, in a different way? So for example, um, we have a twice a month meeting with our head of IT, uh, our head designer, our chief operations person, myself, and then my assistant. Um, we decided to start doing this because with time zone differences, you know, the designer would make some change for the website or for social media, then 
12 hours later, I would approve it and have a question. 12 hours later, she would um, make a change and things took forever. And there's so much back and forth. And we found that if we just have a one hour meeting every other week, and we just in real time, walk through a few of the things, just check through it, it's faster for everyone overall. It speeds things up where this thing that used to be an hour meeting sometimes comes in at 28 minutes. You know, So figuring out how do we just speed things up and be more efficient, sometimes it is a meeting and sometimes it's not a meeting. Oh, great example. Okay, so future, future. Is it Wednesday's a new Thursday? What's <laughs> what's the next book, I guess? Are we, how, how is work going to keep changing? <laughs> Yeah, you know, so I think that Thursday is the new Friday is an idea that can be adapted. Um, I wrote a Harvard Business Review article about how to talk to your boss about the four-day work week. And um, it may not be Fridays. It may be if 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 you're in logistics and Fridays are the easiest day to talk to all the logistical coordinators, don't take Fridays off. Have, have it be Thursday afternoon. Have it be, you know, Monday morning. Um, having each team do some experiments around Okay, we're going to try to do half days on Wednesdays and see what happens. What falls apart? What do we want to keep from our culture? What are the KPIs that we're already judged by? And then we look at that and say, okay, how are we doing? Every week, just having a quick meeting of, hey, you know, we're all calling each other Wednesday afternoon. We said we we're going to take it off um, or our sales are down, our sales are up and sharing those best practices. As, as we look forward, I would say that Right now, it's still so new to be challenging the four-day work week or to be implementing the four-day work week, challenging the 40-hour work week. So what we're starting to see is more and more businesses doing experiments, doing um, beta test groups. Uh, we're seeing school systems start to do it. We're seeing community colleges start to do it. Um, you know, just in, I think it was Golden, Colorado, they did it across the board um, with their entire system. Uh, so police officers, firefighters, ambulance drivers, people are like, how the heck do they do that? Well, they just looked at the schedule and, and they made sure that people had three days off and, and that they did better scheduling. And now it's a lot easier to recruit people to work for their small town because they know they're getting a four-day work week, that they're not going to be burned out. They're not going to be having tons of overtime. I forgot, I heard a uh, NPR or CNN article about them. I forgot how many millions of dollars they saved in just overtime, um, just by being smarter about how they're operating. So to me, that next phase is really going from early adopters, like any new technology or mindset, into uh, the folks that are really early testers. So not just early adopters, but you know, really testing it, finding best practices, sharing that within those particular fields. Because you know, an ambulance driver, that's going to be a different modality than an entrepreneur like myself. And so that, to me, is the next phase, is really starting to implement towards the, the broader public. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember there's a famous quote, uh, as work productivity is increasing, I don't remember who it's from. I thought it was from like a governmental official. I talked about how, you know, with the way that we're improving at work and being more productive sooner or later, we're going to be working like five hour weeks. Like we're, we're not even going to have to work. And lo and behold, we have just kept raising the bar on what we need to accomplish. So let let's say that we do get to a point where yeah let's let's not just do four four day work weeks but three day work weeks let's just we we figured out that we don't actually need to work this five day work week type of schedule for some people seven days a week what do we do with our time you know I was uh, I was in Chicago with my daughters and, and my partner and we went to the Field Museum and we went through this whole um, like the evolution of humans section. And they went back to the hunter gatherers. And when I think hunter gatherer, I picture people that are hunting and hungry and trying to find food and it's just all consuming. But the reality is, is, is they, they've looked at it and most likely they had to work about an hour a day to feed themselves. When you look in nature, whales and, you know, mammals across the board and all sorts of animals just live life. They don't spend their days toiling away. Sure, squirrels have to find a bunch of nuts, but you know, when we look at it in nature, animals do other things. And, and I think that it, it gets to a deeper human experience of, of saying, what do we want our human experience to be for the 80 to 100 years we live here? 
Of course, we need to provide for our families. Of course, we want to be smart with our finances within the system that we're in. Uh, I'm not saying throw all of that out. Um, we got to be smart about retirement. We got to be smart about investments and, and utilizing the whatever gifts or talents we've been given. And if we start to work less, uh, we might be able to challenge the overemphasis on work. I mean, the default for most people, if it's the evening, uh, is to either check their email because they feel like then the next day is somehow going to be easier because they're quote caught up, but they're actually feeding that beast where then other people are getting that email and responding back and it's not helping them. Or they just go into social media because they want to break from the world or they want to just watch TV. If we work less, we can then ask ourselves, like, what's the impact that we want here? What's the creativity we want? Where is that life? Uh, and what's it look like for me if it isn't just toiling away at work? That is a really, really strong and powerful question. What is life if it's not just work? And I, I love the comparison to animals because unless, unless they're protecting themselves, procreating or eating, like they're playing or they're resting. Like, yeah. And I'm sure maybe there's some other behaviors that I'm missing, but we have work because we've created work as a way for us to earn money and that money to then live in society. Most of us aren't working for the benefit, like the actual benefit of our community or we we have trades we have practices we're not just raising the kids or building homes or hunting for our food for our food for everyone to eat generally that's not the case anymore we can turn the faucet on or turn the faucet off um very 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 strong points and i'm going to spend some time reflecting on what you just said and i love that comparison again so thank you joe i appreciate that yeah you know, there was a section I wrote about of apex predators. Um, I, I was just interested in thinking as I kind of went down that path, like if we just look, you know, in certain areas, you know, the apex predators, uh, there's nobody that's hunting them except for usually humans. Like a typical male lion sleeps like 20 hours a day. You know, and no one, no one calls the 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 lion a lazy, you know, animal. It it, it just does what it does, and, and so there, there's such an opportunity to challenge you know what's really fueling this overemphasis on work like is it our egos is it is it that we feel like we don't know how to sit with ourselves that we don't like our spouse like like what is it that we're solving by working too much um because oftentimes it's we're either running away from something or we're running toward what we think is going to bring us happiness we're attaching to something in some way and it's fueling this behavior that ultimately lots of times isn't serving us. Well, listeners, you heard it. That's your homework. Go explore your relationship to work and what it means to you. And Joe, if our listeners want to find out more about you, about how to answer this question, about how to get a copy of the book, what can they do? Yeah, Thursday is the new Friday. It's it's everywhere. Um, Amazon, local bookstores, uh, probably your library. Um, feel free to pick it up. Um, also, I have the practice of the practice podcast where we cover all sorts of business and life issues on there from a therapeutic perspective. Um, and then lastly, uh, I have an assessment that we put together um, with the help of some researchers to help people really identify their internal inclinations, some things that are going to help you be more successful in life and business. And then to look at, hey, where am I at in regards to this? And that's over at joesanoc.com. Uh, we're actually, for your audience, waiving the $50 fee if they just use code T-I-T-N-F. So for Thursday is the new Friday, just that acronym. Um, if they just enter that in, uh, that'll waive the fee for that over at joesanoc.com. Awesome, Joe. Thank you again for your time. Listeners, all that information will be in the show notes. And I'm going to go reflect on how I can be more like an apex predator. So I appreciate the conversation today, Joe. You've been part of the Live For Yourself revolution. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure to share with a friend and spread the good word. Until next time, keep on living for yourself. <laughs>